Today, I wish to speak to you about a magical place called Rhythmia and a story of personal transformation with the support of some amazing shamans and a sacred medicine called ayahuasca. Now, Rhythmia is a facility located in Costa Rica. We've spoken on it in several previous videos, which is really a one-of-a-kind place. It's the world's first medically licensed plant medicine facility. And that's not to say there aren't plenty of other places that offer this, and truly anywhere that you can get authentic shamanic support for using the medicine is sacred and beautiful. And I'm speaking about Rhythmia today because this is where I am, even as we speak right now, and where this story has unfolded. Rhythmia was created by a man named Gerard Powell, this absolutely incredible person who went through some of the most brutal life experiences in his early years that caused him to become as he described it, really a monster. A horrible, cruel, self-interest-motivated person. And through his story, he's shared that he took a medicine called Iboga, also here in Costa Rica. And the medicine lifted him from his body, and he spoke with the moon. And the moon guided him to find his soul and his soul showed him what happened to him when he was a child. He was molested by his grandfather. This act happening as he was such a young child created a schism between his soul and his body. And his body became, his, 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 his human became an absolutely terrible person and his soul became separate for a very long time. But with the help of the medicine, and the power of forgiveness, and the support of the shaman, he reunited his soul and his body and experienced the deepest healing, cleansing himself of his cruelty, of his abuse, and finding deep forgiveness and even gratitude for the story because it allowed him to see and understand life in a way that many don't have the awareness to see. Jerry ended up taking the plant medicine a lot after that, hundreds of journeys, and documented all of them, learning from the spirit of the medicine and the spirit of the, the earth and the moon. <laughs> and all of the light of heaven, and coming to understand that he had a role, he had a, a duty and work to do to help prepare this world for, for the shift. And that's why he created Rhythmia. This is a place designed for light workers and light warriors to come and heal their hearts, to merge back with their souls, and to find out who they've become in doing so, transform themselves into a vessel of love and light that can give that gift of love, compassion, truth to the world and help facilitate the change that is coming that we're all experiencing actively right now. This change is a change in thinking. It's a change in perspective, a change in the way that we look at the world. And it's so beautiful. But one of the things in how this medicine works is that it's purging the darkness. It's purging the negativity. It's like ingesting a concentrated dose of nature, a highly concentrated dose of nature that gets into your system. And the way that they like to describe it that I really love is that as you're going through your life, you know, you have all these emotions that come up. And 
whenever you have an emotion that's not expressed, that you know, it gets bottled up, it gets repressed, it's like you take that emotion, you put it in a plastic bag, and you seal it up inside of you. And when you seal it there, it just builds and builds every time you add another bag. You become negative or filled with, 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 with this, this repressed, concentrated energy. And the medicine goes in and starts dissolving the bags. And so you have this this period of purging that takes place, and often it comes in the form of vomiting, it comes in yawning, laughing, sweating, crying, pooping, <laughs> and it, it just it just pours out. And then, in the absence then of that negativity, once it's out of you, there is a vacuum of spirit within you, where your soul just brings in the light with the power and the support and the energy of the shamans and the medicine and the sacredness of the space, you are filled with a deeper, newfound awareness of who and what you really are. And it transforms you. It rewrites the neurological pathways in the brain and allows you the shift in thinking to take place naturally. There are so many ways to get here, by the way. It's important to note that you could spend years doing fasting, meditation every single day for hours. You know, you could like go into solitude. You can probably do chants and all sorts of things, you know? But the two fastest ways, at least as I've come to understand it, to create this transformation is plant medicine and breath work. Breath work on the other side, also very powerful, something that everyone can do, is the process of facilitating breathing faster than you normally do. For example, if you were to do that practice, deep circular breathing, but for like an hour straight, it facilitates a rapid moving of oxygenation through your, through your blood and through your brain, and it elevates your consciousness and moves you to a higher, a higher place of thinking. And that's why at Rhythmia, these are the two practices that we do. We do a breath work and we do a medicine. And sometimes on the medicine, you find that you want to do the breath work. It just happens naturally. And so, I have been to Rhythmia several times now. This trip, as I'm filming today, is uh, February 16th, 2019. The first time that I came here was actually exactly one year ago, um, February 2018. This was my fifth trip. And the course of the progression over this journey has completely shifted and transformed my understanding of everything in such a beautiful way that I owe the deepest debt of gratitude to Rhythmia, to Jerry, to all of the shaman here. They are all so beautiful. This is so precious and sacred that I'm appearing to you now to tell you about it because it can't wait any longer. There's too much to do. There's a change coming. It's happening now. And so I have some notes here that I might reference throughout just to make sure I cover all of my points. Perfect. And the, fi the, 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 the final point of that section and the bridge to the next one is the idea of the core belief. You see, when we're all young, there is a schism that happens naturally. We are designed to break um, between our soul and, our, and our, 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 our ego, if you will. We're designed to break because it's a part of our, our, our human story, our human journey through life. You know, we're born so innocent and something changes at some point where we just become a little bit disconnected. And some of us more than others, depending on what happened to you in your life. 
This is this idea of a core belief that's not true. We come to believe something about ourselves that's not true about ourselves. It's not true. But we believe it because it's a part of the story that we lived. And doing this work here with the ceremonies is about recognizing that core belief and merging back with our souls so that we can embody our true selves. So my core belief was I am not who I am. This idea that I developed my personality based on what I thought other people wanted me to be. I acted and lived and, 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 and behaved according to what I thought my, my peers and my parents and my, those people around me said that I should be or what I believed would make them laugh. For example, sometimes making uh, inappropriate or stupid jokes in school, for example, because I thought it would make people laugh and if people laughed, then I was funny and if I was funny, then people would like me, for example. And so I went through this powerful, the first trip that I came here, I went through this purging of uh, what, what I actually experienced as uh, this giant angry head biting onto my belly. And if you've ever seen the show called Attack on Titan, it was like, it was like this Titan head, this large head right here with like, ah, like really strong teeth gripping, biting into my belly. And this was a manifestation of my core belief, I'm not who I am, that gripped me by the belly and caused me to act in a way that was different than how I would act purely from the heart, how my soul would behave. My soul had complete control of this body. And it was amazing, especially because as I saw that in the ceremony, I just breathed into it and actually gave it love. And the head melted and it became this swirling vortex that harmonized with my body, like as if it was a part of me that just needed correction, you know? It wasn't like this separate demonic entity. It was, a, it was me, but it was the part of me that had grown destitute and disconnected from, from my heart. And through the process of this healing that took place, I received a winged heart, or rather maybe a heart crowned with wings. One of the, the sort of the, the things that happens here that they speak on is receiving a new heart. And this was like this sacred gift from heaven that just sort of descended down and, and entered into my chest. And it happened during this, the intention that I came with, speaking to that very briefly too, and how it fits together is, Jerry said that, you know, this is a place of miracles and he's, absolutely right and during one of his first talks he said there's no such thing as a miracle too big to ask for so go big and I said I want to embody the Spirit of Christ because when I thought about what what is the most important thing to me that is it I, I want to be a voice and a light a demonstration of what it means to be fully in alignment and connected to God and Spirit and Christ and nature. And I'm going to speak more about this in a moment, but just to, to, to draw the line and be very clear, I'm not claiming to be Jesus. I am Jordan. There's a difference. So after I received the heart, I traveled through time back to the point of my birth. This is, this was so amazing. Um, my, a little bit about me. <laughs> a month after I was conceived, my biological father killed himself because he wanted my mom to have an abortion. And my mom said no because when she went inside and felt me there, she said there was a light there. 
and it wasn't right to get rid of it. My father was filled with torment by this decision. He, he, he was afraid, I'm certain he was ashamed, he was angry, and so he took his own life. The trauma of that put tremendous abandonment and hate and anger into me as a child, as a, as a fetus even, that I carried with me all my life and didn't even know it. And so during that ceremony, I traveled in time and went back to his funeral. One thing that my mom had shared with me was that ever since that funeral, she saw his soul walking up and down the aisle of the church, filled with dread and regret and shame. What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? And after the funeral, he disappeared and she never connected with his soul again. She never felt him. He never came to her in a dream. There was, there was, it was just emptiness. He was gone. And so I went back to the funeral and I saw his energetic footprints. I saw them go up off into space and I followed him. And I followed him for 27 years worth of my life of him going off into the middle of nowhere, into complete blackness and I found him pressed up against an invisible wall in the middle of a void he was banging banging on this invisible glass I would say glass but just just this nothing there just banging trying begging for for healing or freedom and, and saying how sorry he was, crying, and he had been there for 27 years. And I appeared to him. I appeared to him as a being of light, just an angel <laughs> radiating a ball of light. And, and I appeared to him and I said, Dad! <laughs> and he didn't hear me because nobody, or rather, he never would have known himself by that name. So I called him by his name. Gary, I said. And he turned. And he said, he saw me, and he said, who are you? And I said, I am your son, the one you had before you died. And his eyes opened wide, and he shattered instantaneously into a fractaling prism of radiant shards that slowly twinkled down into the depths of the void and disappeared from sight. And then I was alone. After a couple minutes of just sort of being there with that, I flew back to my body during the ceremony. And I experienced more transformation that just continued to the end of the ceremony, like as if that really didn't even happen, meaning like the, what happened in the rest of the ceremony really had nothing to do with that, that happening. And I, I wondered for two days, will I ever see him again? What's, what was, I mean, what will come from that? And on the last ceremony, at Rhythmia you do four, they map over the four elements, so it goes earth, air, water, and fire, or youthful female, youthful male, mature female, mature male. And it was on that king, that final, that final ceremony. I, I drank the medicine and I lied down and I actually fell asleep. And it was when I woke up 
right, as they were calling for the second cup, that I, I woke up to a nebula, this, this rainbow galaxy nebula in space. I was just floating in it, and I just felt his presence. It was like I knew he was there with me. And I had this, this funny feeling of my father who art in heaven. It was so beautiful, and I knew that his soul had been released into the All-Father, into the Great Mother, into the universe. And he had finally, <laughs> he had finally found peace. <laughs> because he knew that there was so much love for him. And that he was forgiven for all of his mistakes. And it was okay, because he did what he came here to do. He had me. And he loved my mom. I'm gonna use this to just... <laughs> I don't have any tissues right next to me, so... That'll do. And so, throughout that ceremony and, and the ones that followed, I continued healing. I continued cleansing myself of past traumas. I have to blow my nose and then I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Next trauma was also one of the biggest that I've been dealing with, and it's a rape allegation against me. I'm so, so grateful for the medicine, being able to provide the healing that I so desperately needed. To be able to come to a point of understanding how and why the entire thing happened. You see, as I kind of described with my core belief, behaving in a way that I thought others wanted, one of the ways that that manifested was that I would give myself to others and hold their trauma for them, try and carry it for them, thinking that it would lighten the load on them. You know, like, uh, like Samwise, asking Frodo if he could take the ring. But it wasn't really Sam's to bear. It was Frodo's. And there's this lesson in here because I had an ex-girlfriend that I was with for about a year, nine months or so. And she had a lot of struggles. She struggled with what she described was multiple personalities. She's publicly written that she had schizophrenia and bipolar, and that she scraped her wrists long before I met her. Though I didn't have all of that information when I met her. When we were together, there's this interesting thing that I've been learning here at Rhythmia about saying yes when you mean no. Now, I have to acknowledge that within myself, I did have this, what could be described as lustful energy, very um, attached to receiving a, a sexual connection. And the reason for that is because I was bullied tremendously in junior high. And, it, and, 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 and because of the way that I was raised and because of the way that I was treated by people, 
I was essentially taught another core belief that in order to be valuable, I have to have a girlfriend. I have to have a partner of some kind. And so this girl and I talked for a very long time, for months before we even met. And there was a very strong sense of connection. She expressed interest in traveling together and being with me and all of this stuff. And when we got together, I asked her, so are we in a relationship now? And of course, I was such a silly, un-suave, is that the word? A, a un, um, just a very a young man, if you will. And so I asked her that, and, and, and it was awkward, I'm certain. And, um, and she said, well, I think we should be friends. And I was like, oh. Are you sure? Can we be together anyways? I mean, I just sort of made the, the, the question again. Um, and then she said, yeah, okay. And this is the pattern that we went through in our relationship, is that she said no, and then she said yes. This happened the first time that we had sex as well. She said no. I asked again, a few times, not a lot. There's a story out there, her story that she told later on that says that I just pressured her and asked over and over and over again until eventually crying, she broke down and said yes. And I'm sorry, but I can't speak to this being the truth because I know what happened. I was there. And the amount of times that I asked happened really over the course of an hour and a half. And during that time, we were cuddling, we were talking about sexuality, about relationships, about energy, about spirituality. And so, it is what it is. And to be honest, looking back is, I believed that both of us experienced some level of sacredness in the connection. And I say that because there was a whole breathing meditation around it, a lot of conversation, a lot of connecting our energies and our breath and just being very present with each other. We were together for nine months and eventually we broke up. And I think largely it actually had to do with the fact that I cheated on her. I, being this, this young man, filled with, I mean, for the first time in my life, I was attractive to people. And I think, you know, spirit science had a big part of that, but all through school, through high school, through junior high, I felt so ugly, so undesired, so unloved, so unwanted. The seeds of that were planted in me from my father and from some other things that happened as well. But I made spirit science and for the first time in my life, there were people that were attractive to me or attracted to me and, and expressed that. And I became carried away in the, 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 the heat of the moment and the love that these other people were giving to me. And so I cheated on her and we talked about it and we decided to break up. And you know, a year later, she actually messaged me and she said, look, the first time that we were intimate, I don't know, she said at first, she's like, I, I kind of felt raped, but, but I know that's not what happened because I said yes. And I said, is there any part of you that enjoyed it? Because I have a very different memory of it. And I was shocked to hear her tell me this. And she said, yeah, actually. I, I feel like a very strong split personality, multiple personalities here. She's like, I said yes because I wanted you to be happy, that I love you. I wanted to, to give you what you wanted. I, I, there was maybe a bit of curiosity there. But at the other side, I, I just wasn't ready. And we talked about it from the perspective that this is something that so many people go through. Something that so many couples deal with. And to be honest, during that talk, I may have even been a little insensitive towards the end of it. 
she said she loved me. And I said, LOL, you're funny. <laughs> because I was feeling guilty to hear that it wasn't as fully a mutually positive experience as I had believed it to be. But she said, there's, there's only forgiveness. She said, don't blame yourself. She said that it is what it is. She said, she's just trying to understand and she's just trying to heal and move forward in her life. She said she's been messed up for a really long time. And she just wants to bring all of it, heal all of it, to, to be able to move on. So we didn't talk for a really long time. And in 2017, the very beginning of 2017, she messaged me again, this time with a very different story. This time she said she was raped, 100%. There was no forgiveness. I would never be forgiven. But that she still wanted the healing and she wanted understanding. And she wanted me to confess to her story. She said that she wanted me to acknowledge her story, just listen to it and confirm it every step along the way. And I, in this feeling of just wanting her to be okay, said, if that's what you need, like setting my memories, setting my story aside, setting what I remember aside and our past conversation even, I just said, if that's what you need, okay, I will do that for you. And so on two separate occasions, we walked through this story and it was very different from the way that she described it the first time and the way that I remember it happening. This time I just hounded her, pressured her, essentially holding her down, but not really, <laughs> just making her do this thing. And she cried through the whole thing and it was awful. And I just said, yes, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it wasn't until the second call, at the end of the second call, that eventually she sort of led me to answer this question, you know, why am I, why was she traumatized? And eventually I, I just surrendered and I said, because you were raped. And the call ended very quickly after that. And it felt to me like she got what she was looking for. And within a month of this, a blog was posted on the internet speaking anonymously about me <laughs> uh, but not using my name, but essentially just very clearly alluding to me and um, talking about how, you know, she had gone, got a detective and recorded this call and got this confession and that she tried to go to the police and the police were like, it was consensual and five years ago because you've acknowledged you said yes, so it's not really rape, there's nothing we can do. And so the next natural thing was to put it on the internet. I created a response on my website, theriveroftjordan.com. I had to create a new blog because I lost my old one. And I responded explaining what happened, how I was asked for that. And I spoke about responsibility. I spoke about learning. I spoke about love and truth and compassion. And her response to that was taking a snippet of our phone call that sounded very awful and putting it up on YouTube. And the result of the entire thing, oh, there was also a blog that some article on some kind of tabloidy news website that put out this whole spirit science creator admits to rape thing and the result of all of that together sent so much hate towards me so much hate i i and i just felt so much shame and so much 
like for even allowing it to happen at all, it, it was so awful. And I just went deep into fasting and meditation and prayer and asking for guidance from, from the universe. And life brought me to Rhythmia. Life connected me with the people, excuse me, who, who are here. And, and some of them are fans of spirit science. And they said, listen, come on, come on out. Be a guest speaker. You have so much to share. And come and heal your heart and learn what you need to learn. It'll be really good for you. And I was like, thank you so much. And I learned about saying yes when meaning no on both sides. You know, the one thing that I've sort of dealt with in terms of frustration with my ex-girlfriend was that she said yes when she meant no. And I can guarantee that if she had not said yes to being together, to always sleeping in the same bed, to being intimate, None of those things would ever have happened. I can guarantee that. But she did say yes. And she never acknowledged that. And yes, I did have this energy. I was feeling like, like I needed a relationship to validate my self-worth. And so, out of that fear of not being enough, it caused me to behave in a way that was simply more animalistic in my nature and that wasn't right for me and I have since cleansed myself of that behavior and come to understand how I received it what happened that brought me to that state I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to learn these lessons honestly looking back and looking at everything I'm grateful I'm so grateful because it was what I needed to learn to get to this place. In fact, on the last, not this trip, but the trip before this to Rhythmia, the biggest lesson that I received was that I have to share this story because there are so many other people who are going through similar things. And it's so important that if I can speak on it from a perspective of, of healing and learning and responsibility, I can help others go through and process their own thing. We have to take responsibility for our own actions and our own decisions, all of us. And we will pay the, kar the karmic price if we don't. And the best way to do it, instead of years of suffering, is like taking the medicine and do it all in one night. You get it out. There's times that you just feel so awful in the medicine. It's you throw up and you're dizzy and you feel just off oh, the worst. It is horrible. And I know it's like, well, that's not very appealing. No, it's not. But what happens on the other side is that you are liberated from years of suffering, from an old way of thinking, and you are delivered into the light of your own heart and the ever-present permeating love that extends through time and space. I've heard stories here of so many other and similar things from other people. I have heard stories of rape. I have heard stories of, of abuse. And I have to say, it is such an honor to share in the space of healing with someone who has gone through that. To be able to, to honor them and support them and love them through through their through their their healing through their forgiveness and actually just speaking to that very quickly you know we um we we have a talk that we give here and aaron shared something this trip that i had actually never heard before but at, at some point there was a study where they 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 some scientists went and they uh, attached eggs i believe they're called to um a group of tibetan monks and they measured their brainwaves and they, they, they 
saw like what 40 years of meditation nonstop does and what it looks like in the brain. And then they went, what is the number one thing you can meditate on that replicates and mirrors that wavelength? It was forgiveness. And this is what happens during this, in these ceremonies is we learn to forgive the worst trauma, things that are unforgivable, like Jerry's story with his grandfather. Part of his story, part of that, that, that first night going through his ceremony is, was getting forgiveness, finding forgiveness for that man and, and all of the abuse that he must have suffered and lifetimes, of generations of suffering and, and, and ugliness that led that event to happen. Forgiveness. And so I've come to a deep sense of forgiveness for both my ex and myself and my other partners and myself for all of the mistakes and, and times that things happened, things were done that didn't want to be done, but but yes was said otherwise out of a desire to make someone else happy. And it's really all about just understanding boundaries and looking at all of those sides and holding firm in what we know, which can be hard to do when we are not connected to ourselves, not connected to our heart, not connected to who we are. So this shift is happening now. And those who choose not to work on themselves and heal themselves will not be able to make it through the shift. But everybody can make it if we're willing to do the work, if we're willing to cleanse ourselves, purify ourselves, change our DNA, and enter into a higher world, a higher paradigm of understanding. Now I would like to speak on Christ, because this has been a tremendous part of my journey here. Ever since the very beginning, since my first intention, and every time I come back, I learn more and more about the nature of Christ, how to live with Christ in my heart. I received an onk in the ceremony at one point, and it lit up my heart as the symbol and image of Christ, the original symbol and image of Christ. For anybody who's curious, yes, in fact, the original symbol of Christ was an onk, which was changed to a cross about 2,000 years ago, a little before, actually. You can look up Coptic Christianity. It's sort of the line that blends between them. Also Gnostic Christianity, you can find out a lot about how Christianity came to be. But the energy of Christ has been present since, for, well, forever, since the fall. And it really came about in ancient Egypt. And it developed through the mystery schools of ancient Greece. There's a lot there, and I've been writing about it. I'm not going to speak so much on the history in this particular talk, but just as a, a, a reference point for anybody who wants to really go deep into the ancient history and the story about how we got here and how all the religions came about, I've been writing it in a story in a, in a book called The Book of Spirit. Uh, we're doing a special pre-order for the book right now. It's almost ready, and... We'll just bring it back to that at the end of this thing, but um, that's available for anybody who's, who's curious. So what I want to share, though, is actually something that I wrote, that I received in a ceremony. On the third trip that I came here, I had set my intention on ascension, and I had received so much understanding about this, and it was, it was amazing because it was like, you know, be patient, it's, it's coming, um, prepare yourself but here's what you need to know right now. And so at the end of this um, 
At the end of this last ceremony, I was brimming to fullness and overflowing with a message, with an, with a, an, an embodiment of an idea. And I called it a message of Christ. And I'm going to read it for you now. This is the last chapter of the fourth part of the Book of Spirit. There's five parts total, one for every element. What I wrote is this. Rejoice! God is alive and magic is afoot. We are in incredible times, for even though the world may feel mundane and tired, each and every moment is an opportunity to radically change everything in life. All that is required is the desire to do so, and the devotion to see it through. This begins as a change which takes place inside, and the outside will naturally come to reflect your inner glow. This is a message for all of the people of the earth. The kingdom of heaven is upon us. It is within us, all around us, and it moves through all things. Most of us cannot see it, for we have spent our lives living in the dark. There are even those who believe they are in the light when their true eye, when their true inner eye is shut. This is a message to all. The time has come for us to make a choice. The choices we make will affect and change our pathway to heaven. Fear not, for all roads up the mountain lead to the summit. You might hear people saying, Jesus is coming back, or that Christ is upon us. You can say it this way as there is truth in this statement. The experience of Christ is accessible to all and is found within by the power of revelation, the awareness of the Creator made manifest within a human form. The experience is not limited to one individual, gender, or faith. The body of Christ is made up of a body of the human collective. He can be accessed by all people of all races, nationalities, and cultures. Each and every one of us can feel and connect with this divine presence who is not limited by culture or belief. Christ is the Holy Word of God and appears throughout life in a multitude of forms. For this reason, I express that it is not necessary to call yourself a Christian, and it is not necessary to follow a specific outwardly path. It is by connecting to your inner child that you may find the one path and find the unity which we call Christ, which is available to all. Any outwardly path that resonates with your open heart can serve you on your journey of self-discovery. Bear deep compassion for all of life and look at the world through the lens of compassion. It is not for us to decide what others do, nor are we to cast judgment upon others who share different beliefs than ourselves. We are only here to make our own choices and cultivate harmony and healing with everyone around us. May we choose to shine our light so bright that those in the darkness can feel our warm glow and be inspired to resonate at a higher level themselves. If the teachings are virtuous, then Christ is with the teachings. Christ can be found with the Tao, with the Buddha, with Thoth. Christ can be found within the Kabbalah, the Tarot, alchemy, and astrology. Christ is present where there is virtue and love, because Christ is the essence of virtue and love. Much like the sun dispenses light and gives life, so too does Christ dispense light and offers eternal life, free of hate and malice. He gives himself endlessly so that all may prosper and find nourishment from his divine presence. His judgment is authentic and based on truth, and so divine retribution comes in equal balance with the distance an ego has traveled from its soul. Divine retribution is only there to serve as a function to bring the ego back into harmony with the spirit. It is time for the belief that my way is the only way to end. It is time for those who proselytize to stop. It is time for racism, sexism, speciesism, and all forms of discrimination to find closure immediately. 
If your faith involves looking down on others because their practices are not the same as yours, then I ask you to repent and repeal your judgment, for you only cast judgment on yourself and condemn yourself to more suffering in this way. The true method of converting others is to be so humble, so radiant, and so beautiful in your love that those around you come to you and ask, how can I be like you? And it is through our humility that the supreme love finds and moves through us. When you meet someone of a different faith from yours, or someone who does not hold to a particular faith, find it within yourself to listen and truly get to know who they are and where they come from, instead of pushing your beliefs on them. Find some common ground and make a connection. Actively look to see where your hearts overlap. You might even discover some new teachings in the process, one which aligns remarkably well with your own heart, and you will see God in the eyes of each other. This does not mean you have to give up what you believe in and start a new journey, though you can if you wish to. All it truly means is that you are encouraged to open your heart, connect with others, and not be afraid of learning something new. In the end, you will find that learning about your brothers and sisters around the world will open yourself up to so much more than you could possibly have imagined a higher truth than you were previously able to conceive. God does not appear in only one singular book. He appears in all books because he appears in all things. We must take that into account and listen to everything, as if there was holy wisdom inscribed everywhere we go. Yes, you will find things which are mundane in life, but by seeing those as they are, you may find more value and respect for that which is sacred. If you find something that you so thoroughly disagree with that it upsets you and makes you feel heavy, I would encourage you to investigate within what it is that's causing you upset and why. No matter what external event displeases you, it is always the inner struggle between perception and experience that needs to be balanced and healed. By identifying and healing your inner experience, you give rise to the external actions you can take to create healing outside of you. It is in this way that we can heal any problem in the world, whether it's starvation, terrorism, sexism, racism, or just outright abuse. Do not cast hate towards the thing that you believe is causing you grief, but turn your light inward and find the source of the hate and the fear. Then cleanse yourself of it, so that you may approach the world with wisdom and compassion. My advice for everyone is to find your medicine and use it. There are many forms of medicine in the world. Food is a medicine. Meditation is a medicine. Exercise and yoga are medicines. Nature is medicine. Even church and spiritual gatherings are medicines. Utilize the ones that serve you the best. For those who truly wish to rise rapidly into the higher realms of understanding and purity, seek out the sacred plant medicines used in holy ritual by the guidance of the Great Spirit and a trained and loving shaman. When used in holy ritual, within a sacred space, and with the utmost respect for the healing process, plant medicine is one of our most powerful tools we have available for purging our darkness and healing our bodies and minds. Purifying in this manner allows us, aligns us with the flow of nature and the rhythm of life. Each of us must acknowledge that we as a species have become toxic. We are cruel, mean, and filled with suffering. Inside, inside, we burn with agony and fear, and it causes us to do all manner of cruel and spiteful things. All of our suffering can be healed. We must humble ourselves before God and throw ourselves at the feet of our beautiful Mother Earth. We must lay down our swords and our shields and purge the evil from our minds and bodies. In this way, we can heal the collective consciousness and avoid disaster in the process. I speak of disaster not to instill fear, 
but as a warning to all. The anger, rage, and hatred we harbor inside will not be without consequences, for there is such a thing as divine judgment, and it will come. We have taken this planet for granted, used and abused her, and if she needs to, she will shake us off, though more likely, shake us up. In order to prepare for what we might describe as the return of Christ or heaven meeting the earth, we must cleanse ourselves. This is a form of Shiva, the inner destruction, destroying that which is toxic within us. Doing so may prevent us from experiencing the intensity of change physically because we may become prepared for it and find peace within. It could happen through war, famine, earthquake, tidal wave, a hoaxed alien attack, or, or events of the like, or something else entirely. I don't claim to know, only to suggest the potential of it all. Yet, even if this retribution comes, through the bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood, we may hold ourselves together and pass through into the kingdom of heaven within our hearts. This change, in many ways, is about reconnecting this planet and our consciousness to the greater celestial family in the heavens above. We are not alone in the universe, and there is a great deal of love for us from our galactic brethren. However, we are not yet at a level of consciousness where we are allowed to spread through our arm of the galaxy, let alone the universe. We have to learn to find peace in our hearts before we can do this, before we can meet our brothers and sisters in space. You might be inclined to call them aliens, However, they are anything but. They are people, they are beings, like you or I, appearing in a multitude of forms. These are beings who, learn how, who have learned to live in harmony with each other and the universe, and so too shall we. But we will not meet them until we have, uh, until we have found peace within ourselves and distilled the fear. At the end of the day, it's about what you were giving. There is a vibration which is in harmony with creation, and there is a vibration which is not. Know that to seek for yourself is not evil, just as the striving of a root in the ground to find water to nourish itself is not evil. The root cannot be compared to the fruit, which by its nature is the embodiment of pure giving. Recognize that you are a tree, growing in all of the ways that trees do. Nobody is suggesting you have to be the image of perfection only that you acknowledge your relationship to something greater than yourself and open your heart to listen deeply to what the cosmos is expressing. The behavior of use and abuse without care for each other and our environment is not sustainable. By purifying ourselves of the irrational torments of matter and letting go to embrace a higher reality of sensitivity and goodness, we will be free of suffering for good. God is with those who are with God, and God is inherent goodness. God is virtue, God is love. God is the wonder in the eyes of an innocent child. God is masculine, and God is feminine, united as one. I ask you to take a deep look at yourself and recognize where you fit into the bigger picture. See yourself not as a separate thing, but a fundamental part of the whole. What do you believe in? What do you follow? What are you learning? What are you sharing? How do you treat yourself? How do you treat others? If you can take all of this into account and get clarity on who you are and where you are in life, then you are on the right track. Take time for self-care, and then take time to care for everything around you. Nurture the love within you and let it spill over into everything that you touch. With great power comes great responsibility. And we have a huge responsibility to bear. It is up to us to bring healing to the collective body of consciousness. It is up to us to, to transform our broken world into one of pure love. I do not claim to be Jesus nor do I claim to be a perfect embodiment of Christ. I am just a river, a messenger, no different from any of you receiving this message. I wish, to, I wish to express what moves through me and to surrender to the sacred teachings. 
there is so much for us to learn from each other, as well as from the mysteries of the universe around us. It is up to us to begin our ascension into the light. It is up to you to make the choice. Wake up. It's time to shine. Name change. I'm changing my name. And as you probably can tell by the name of this video, I am changing my name legally to Jordan River. This is a name that was gifted to me by a Buddhist monk who I've never met through a friend who, um, it happened actually in 2013, I believe. He, uh, he said he went to a temple and there was this Buddhist monk who wrote on a fan and he gave it to him and he said, you have to teach the river to love. And uh, only in like 2017, 2018, I started to really feel that name come into my heart. And there's been, I've gone through several names. Jordan David, Jordan Duknich, Jordan Pierce. If my father hadn't killed himself, I would have had a different name. And, and so I've really struggled with sort of just the finding myself because um, I just never really felt I had a name that was mine. And so at long last, I've decided it's time to officially take the jump and I'm changing my name to Jordan River. And uh, yeah, so that's just that. And I, I just want to let everybody know, you know, I apologize for the confusion over the years because I've published Spirit Science under Jordan David, Jordan Douglas, Jordan Pierce. And it's just time, it's time for something solid something official, something final. And this, this is the one. And I'm grateful for it. I love it. It, it suits me. I am the river. <laughs> um, okay. There is so much information that is available to you at your fingertips right now. There is so much information. I have poured myself into two books, The Book of Patch and The Book of Spirit also Patch Tarot, which goes along with the whole thing. It is an entire diagram of alchemy, astrology, theurgy, understanding of the, the totality of the, how the elements work, how, how it works from this ancient consciousness perspective. And I just, I just want to encourage everybody to learn, 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 learn. It's time to learn. Pick up the book of Patch, learn it, study it. I have poured myself endlessly into this book and Aaron did the best job of formatting it ever. So these books are available right now on our store and I really want to encourage you to go and check them out. Please, please, please. It it means the world to me to know that, that this information is not just sitting around not being tapped into. There is a wealth of knowledge. There is so much to learn and it will dramatically help you in your understanding and, 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 and supporting you in your growth and your understanding. And um, if, you, if you just want a taste of it, you know, we have an app for Patch to Row. It's available, it's only a few dollars. And there's, you can use it, it to answer any question. And it just means the world to me to know that like, I mean, if you look at some of the testimonials that exist out there for these things, it's like, wow. I am so humbled and amazed by the love that, 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 that these things have received. And um, I just want to encourage everybody to really go and check that out. The final invitation is to come to Rhythmia. Come to Rhythmia. And, and, and look, I understand, like, uh, there's been a few people who said, like, why don't you advertise other places? Listen, there's Pachamama. There's go and see Taita Juanito directly. There's other places connected with the great grandfather, shaman, spirit, master. And all of these places are connected. There's plenty of places that you can come and do this plant medicine, but I am really recommend Rhythmia just because of my experiences here. I, this is the one that I can speak to. And I've spoken with Jerry and we have a special new discount code. Like um, people, you know, like it, it costs a little bit of money to come here, it does. And it's like $2.99 a night right now. And I talked with Jerry and we're going to give $300 off if you refer Spirit Science. So you get like a whole night free, basically, as a part of your coming. And because in the past it was $150. And 
I just really wanted to make it more accessible. And I was like, you know, I understand a lot of our audience doesn't have tons of resources. And so is there something we can do? And so we doubled the discount. It costs a lot to run this place. And um, we're even Jerry and everyone here is still finding out how to make it really financially viable because there's, it's, 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 when you see it here and you see everything that goes into it, it is immaculate. It is the nexus of heaven on earth and it's so clean, it's so modern, yet immersed in, in, in nature in the most beautiful of ways. I can't encourage you enough. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but please come to Rhythmia, save your money, get a flight and come here. Come here, just call them, tell them Spirit Science sent you, and I need to come right now. <laughs> and, and, and just purge, cleanse yourself, heal yourself, heal your heart, because you will become a powerful instrument for the whole world, a powerful instrument for the whole world to go through this shift that we're all experiencing. And I would love to meet you. We're coming again at the end of June, and it's going to be our last trip of this year. Now, there is a little other. I'm going to be coming at the end of the year in November for a special LGBT event. Um, so if anybody is specifically in that uh, way, come to that one. That'll be really great. I don't know how to word it. I'm sorry. Um, because I've, I've been in a, a long relationship with a man and have learned a lot of interesting things about sexuality and bisexuality, and I'm really excited to speak about it all. But the last official spirit science trip is gonna be uh, just at the end of June, and we'd love to see you, but, but please don't limit yourself to having to come when we come. Like, just fill it up, please, if you can. I just can't. <laughs> Hopefully, from this testimonial so far, you can see how important it is of everything. How important it is to everything. How important it is to, to this shift we're going through. So, the last... Okay, and the, finally, I just I have to encourage everybody also be mindful. When it comes to plant medicine, um, I have learned that certain antidepressants can react negatively with the medicine and cause some psychosis. So please communicate with Rhythmia beforehand or, or anywhere that you plan to do it and just talk to them. Tell them very clearly if you're on medication, if you're, you know, whatever. The medicine can absolutely help, but it might be very valuable to stop uh, doing a lot of stuff like that beforehand, you know, with at least for a couple of weeks. Uh, I don't know all the specific protocols, but we do have to be careful, you know, these are, these are powerful, powerful medicines and not to be taken lightly, but be, to be treated with tremendous, tremendous, tremendous love and respect. Yeah, so the, uh, the way I want to end this video is I want to actually create a very special invitation. I want to invite Rupert Grint Emma Watson and Daniel Radcliffe to come and join us for our June 30th Rhythmia trip ceremonies. I know that it's probably, you know, they probably will never even hear about this and it's probably like a long shot, but I just felt very compelled to ask. Um, you guys have provided so much, like I grew up with you guys, you know, in, in the way that I did. And, and you guys just brought me so much just love and learnings and, 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 and joy. Being able to grow up with Harry Potter in all of the ways, it was just, it, I don't know why, I just kind of received that I wanted to make that invitation and to say thank you. Oh, and uh, bring your wands, just in case. So without further ado, thank you everybody so much for watching this whole video. It means the world to me. And I do hope and wish you a most blessed day, week, month, year, and life. Time is now. It's time to shine. Peace out.